uh, welcome to the Hangout. So this is uh, a new podcast that we're going to be hosting on here at Qalam. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Basically, myself and Ustad Murphy, who's on here, uh, you'll be hearing from him in a bit. Uh, we have a lot of regular conversations, obviously, day in, day out. Um, just personal conversations, I guess what you can call professional conversations, religious, spiritual, social uh, discussions all the time. And one of the things that we've thought about for quite some time is to have a podcast where we share some of those conversations with y'all. Um, so since this is the very first episode, I thought I would just kind of give you an explanation as to what exactly you're listening to, because particularly if you are uh, a listener of the podcast, a subscriber to our Qalam podcast, and if you're not, then you need to be, uh, you know, you're used to hearing basically what are essentially lectures, the Sira podcast with myself, Lives of the Prophets uh, with Mufti Kamani, and uh, a lot of other stuff, alhamdulillah, but this probably is kind of strange, kind of out of the blue where I'm just talking to y'all. So I thought I'd give you a little explanation. Uh, that's basically what's going to be happening. Just different conversations that relate to our lives, our communities, our deen, our world that we live in. Um, so since this is the very first episode, thought I'd kind of fill y'all in on what's going on and um, let's get started. Yeah, and just to give you an idea, um, we were going to call it the Nobody Cares podcast because, yes. like, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And because I'm eating pineapple while we're talking. Yeah, nobody cares. <laughs> I always thought the Arabic word for pineapple is kind of weird. Ananas. I am people. <laughs> That's not what it is. <laughs> <laughs> am I putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think I'm choking. I'm pineapple. That's, like, the most, like, ignorant Arabic thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I am people. <laughs> It's just one of those dumb puns. Um, but yeah, so the Nobody Cares podcast, the reason why you know we were going to call it that in the first place was because we don't take ourselves too seriously. And also, um, you know, a lot of times people sort of get caught up in discussions and sort of like these really esoteric debates online and things like that. And that nobody cares about. Yeah. And we just <laughs> basically, and we just I'm wanted just to, whisper. and we just, you're just ruining it. And we, <laughs> and we just wanted to sort of like kind of shed light. A lot of people actually ask me, you know, what's it like hanging out with Sheikh Abba Nasser? And it's such a weird, yeah, I know. Why? For those you couldn't see, because you're listening to a podcast, uh, he just like did a double take. It is weird, um, but you know, a lot of people ask, and so we thought the hangout would be an appropriate term because we're not anybody special. We just wanted everyone to come hang out with us and listen and on some conversations that we have. So um, we were gonna do like initially, we were gonna do some like introduction type episode, but we thought that'd be kind of strange. Uh, you'll probably just get to know us through the podcast uh, itself. And at some point, we'll just. Part of the conversation might be, might involve elements of our personal journeys, our personal stories. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Like your pineapple <laughs> and your struggle with eating pineapple. While being on a microphone. Yeah. Uh, but the, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about, you know, today is October 20 something, uh, 26, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 26. So one of the things I, I thought that would be relevant, you know, cause this is something that we deal with a lot. Uh, you know, I serve as a sort of associate imam. Uh, not sort of, I do serve as an associate imam in a couple of communities here. You obviously were a formal imam and now you're kind of just like this Dallas imam where you do stuff all over the place, um, all over Dallas, as well as run the seminary here at Qadam and X amount of things. But we got a lot of questions regarding like family, culture, mm -hmm. living in America. Raising and kids uh, here. we're just a few days away from the uh, Sheikh. Uh, the Abdul greatest Hakim, day of the year. Sheikh Abdul Hakim Quick's video where he talks about the pagan origins of Halloween. Right. And the accompanying uh, takfir being made on yeah. anybody who hands out candy. And I'll be honest with you, Sheikh. Uh, just a few years ago, I myself was somebody who was very vehement in my um, sort of – Yeah, opposition of Halloween and sort of things like that. And that's not to say that now I've I've seen the light and I'm somehow you know different or more enlightened, but – I I was making fun at sort of like the way people interpret it or establish a ruling on it, but I myself was of that group. Um, but again, as you get older, sort of things change. And I think that that's something that a lot of people are embarrassed to admit. Mm. But as you get older, you sort of maybe become more mature or you ripen more. your understanding, your your wisdom increases. And uh, that's not to say that I'm like, you know, going to be trick-or-treating myself this year, nope. just wearing a giant uh, white sheet as a ghost. <laughs> Uh, the ghost of Halloween past, but um, some thoughts on Halloween. I know you were talking to the students yesterday about it. Uh, first I just of all, thought of something. I'm going to go as a pandu. <laughs> <laughs> you're 
You mean a panda? <laughs> a pandu. Pandu the panda? <laughs> exactly, Bur- pandu the panda. This is a guy who just walks around burping, <laughs> dressed up in a panda outfit. Uh, so you grew up in Arlington, Texas. Yes. Very, um, st- let's say, conservative Arab community. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, obviously maybe a little bit more Salafi leaning. Yeah. And, um, it, and it was a suburban community. The the Quran and Sunnah Society started here. Yeah, Quran QSS, Quran and Sunnah Society started here. Isn't that just Islam? Quran and Sunnah Society? <laughs> Isn't that Muslim society? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting place, even, you know, socioeconomically. It started off as a college town, University of Texas at Arlington, mm-hmm. where the UT system kind of, they really placed a lot of their engineering schools uh, out here. So it was really known for its engineering department. So obviously, because it was known for its engineering department, there were tons of brown people here. Everybody. <laughs> and right. halal markets. All of India and Pakistan basically migrated here. <laughs> <laughs> engineers, man. They just man. airlifted Hyderabad. A- a- any Pakistani Indians that couldn't become doctors became engineers. Mashallah. So, um, and also my dad. <laughs> my dad as well, actually. Nice. But um, yeah, so they, um, so that that's kind of the makeup of the community. And then... At some point in time, there was kind of like this interesting infusion of Islamic, a particular type of ideology in Islamic thought. It was very socially conservative, mm. uh, very kind of uh, rigid. What do you mean by socially conservative? Socially conservative that um, it's always better to call it haram than call it halal. So here's a question. Like, isn't that in some, like, you know, ihtiyat and mm-hmm. like wara, like these mm-hmm. con- these terms that we learn to translate for the listeners, like ihtiyat is like caution, right? Mm-hmm. That's how you translate it. Precautious. Wara is like piety. Right. Uh, you know, cautious piety. Yeah. Isn't that praiseworthy? I mean, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to... Your personal to... life. Oh, okay. It's so... good. It's great in your personal life. It's fantastic. It's like, it's like dieting. Like, I, I you know, I just started, I just kind of got back on the train. I know you've been on choo-choo. it for a while. Yeah, choo-choo. exactly. It's, it's like this very hungry, angry train. <laughs> <laughs> it's eating lettuce all day. Yeah. yeah. That just eats like, like goat food. Um, <laughs> just eating grass all day. But, you know, when Shout you. Shout out ca- to Moe's Bwani. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, when you're, you know, dieting. So for right now, Piety or ca- precaution, I guess, better word, precaution on my part, having put on some extra pounds, is not eating rice and bread mm. uh, and cutting out sugar. Sugar and all okay? that, Okay? Yeah. But I can't call it haram. Mm. I can't, like, walk around slapping rice out of people's hands. As <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't like, see my son eating, like, a piece of bread and go and just start beating him up for eating bread. Yeah. Right? I okay. mean, he's... He's not eating a battery. He's eating bread. Yeah. You know, so that's the deal. And um, so that's, yeah, precautions, fantastic. You said eating battery too comfortably. Has it happened before? <laughs> no, not okay, yet. Good, good. It just popped into my head. I had yeah. this mental image. Just childhood memories. <laughs> yeah. So, so socially conservative. And now we just established, I guess, what we would call like personal, personal concern. Right? Yeah. So like my own personal piety. Yeah. You know, the difference, I, I've also heard you use the word taqwa and fatwa, right? Yeah, so the yeah, idea yeah. of like what's legal fatwa, what's what's communally, communally obligated in terms of fatwa and what is personally, uh, you know, sort of being uh, held to a standard, personal yeah. standard. So you, you were in a community where, where let's say um, socially conservative would mean when a person takes what should be personal yeah. and projects it. Yeah, basically. So I don't want a television in my home because it's just – a lot of garbage on TV. It's just a waste. Uh, Which there, are, there is. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I know. I know some very smart people uh, who aren't religious at all. Not Muslim, not Christian, not Jewish, not nothing. Um, they're very secular. They're not very religious at all. But they're like super intellectual. They're professors and PhDs, and they're really into education and things like that. And um, they don't have a television in their home. And the reason why they don't have a television in their home is because they just feel like it's a waste of time. It makes you dumb, mm. all this kind of stuff. So I have a friend uh, who has a PhD in education uh, and was a principal of a school and runs a school now. And, um, you know, she doesn't have a television and she's got, mashallah, a beautiful family, great kids, doesn't have a TV in her home. Mm. So... um so yeah, but that's that's a personal thing. But the second I start going up to the member and start going to the community and start kind of pulling up to people's homes and putting out like yeah, putting out putting out your baseball bat. Yeah, putting <laughs> putting emails out into the community mm. about how TV is haram. There's a big difference between those two things. Okay, humongous. And, and, and like so, obviously the obvious question is like. 
do we have an example of this? Because because I think a lot of times what ends up happening with religious scholarship is they give like out of good out of good intention concern mm-hmm. they give what they think to be like really beneficial for the community and r- what you're saying right now may actually shock a lot of people mm-hmm. right um but I, obviously we have to make sure we tie it to something like mm-hmm. we can't just have these religious proclamations and not have yeah. it come from you know the Some religion of grown into the society right yeah. <laughs> so what like did the prophet Sultan have an example where he did more than he told people to do? Oh, absolutely. And and what's really, really fascinating about that is that there's a couple of different narrations where he uses very clear verbiage that communicates that. He says, Lawla an ashuka ala ummati, la amartuhum bisiwaki inda kulli yes. Yeah, that if I didn't want to make my ummas, if it was not for making their lives very extremely difficult, I would have commanded them, made it mandatory upon them that they had to do sawak at every single prayer time. Mm. He said the same thing about the night prayers as well. So he clearly had, and the night prayers, like Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha talks about how the Prophet never left, never abandoned the night prayers. Like he never missed a single night, but he never mandated it on every single person. Mm. And then also there's the con- like the concept of him saying, that I would have commanded it. That's showing us that he does it. Yeah, exactly. Because he's not going to command something he doesn't do. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and, so, and I mean, she she says that I I couldn't count how many times in a day I saw him doing miswak. Wow. But he never wow. commanded it. And even on his deathbed, I have to say Exactly. When he couldn't do it himself, like he pointed at when Abdurrahman, uh, the son of Abu Bakr, who came to check because Aisha was taking care of the Prophet, mm. and he pointed at his shirt because he couldn't even talk at that point. It was the last few moments of his life. Mm. And he had a brand new miswak kind of tucked into his shirt. And he pointed at it and she asked for it and she kind of peeled it. And, you know, before you use a miswak, kind she of the stick, yeah. you, you got to kind of chew it up and loosen up the bristles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so his mouth was so dry. Um, she basically did it. And then, uh, she was able to kind of like pass it over his teeth because she knew that that's something that he preferred to do. Mm. Um, and it's actually kind of on a side note, it's a really beautiful thing because he used to do it before he prayed, uh, which was him talking to Allah. Mm, so like him you, wanting to do it at that moment yeah. was because he was leaving. Just like we take breath mints now yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So there is something tying us down to this idea or concept that you can do things for yourself. Right. You can hold yourself to a higher standard. Right. That's not legally mandated on the rest of the Muslim Ummah. Not at all. Okay. So now let's go back to Arlington, Texas. Right. Yeah. So socially conservative. It's a place that unfortunately had a little bit of this going on where yeah, there'd be a like, lot of projection. Lot of, what what of did that do rig- by the way like, to the community? Like what did that do? Oh no. What did it do to the community? <sighs> So is this where we insert crying face? Crying yeah, emoji? exactly. The crying emoji. Do you want a tissue? Uh, no, it's just, um, so the community wasn't really huge. So my generation obviously was a lot smaller in number. Um, but the majority of them, if you understand percentages, cause if I gave you a number like eight guys, you'd be like, okay, that's only eight dudes out of like 800. <laughs> right. But that's eight out of 10 for us. Oh, wow. Um, so laughing stops. Yeah. Yeah. That's serious. The vast overwhelming majority ended up, um, really, really jaded, disenfranchised, disenchanted with just Islam altogether. And this isn't like us saying like, Oh, these are non Hafad. Like that's not, that's not anyone's goal. I think there's this huge misconception that, uh, even Qalam, like people have this idea that like, our goal or the goal of every imam is to make every person like this like or... Abu Dhar, like this right. like incredibly ascetic person who like yeah. curses decorations in the masjid and things like we're, I think our goal as a community is just to have everyone love Allah and his messenger absolutely, and, and live life sort of reflecting that because we yeah. all struggle. Yeah. So what you're saying now is these guys weren't even like for, forget, you know, mashallah yourself took the course of scholarship. They weren't even like coming to the masjid for Jummah. No, I mean, and... I mean, not even Ramadan. No, and I'm talking about even further out. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, where many of them just decided to deliberately live a very counter, what I would call a counter Islamic, anti spiritual lifestyle. So just resentful. Just, yeah, angry, resentful. Um, and when I kind of took the path that I did, uh, which was nothing special, it was just me wanting to study for myself. Um, but. A lot of them just kind of like even resented me. 
Oh, just because of what you represented. What I represent, because I represented that. Well, I mean, let's let's take a break here. And <laughs> you memorize the Quran at ten, right? Inshallah or eight. Inshallah. Inshallah, it's already it already happened though. <laughs> Mashallah, eight or ten? It was eight, right? Ten. Ten. Okay, ten. I just want to let the listeners know just just the environment. You listen, you're coming to hang out with us, right? Let me yeah. let me open up a little bit. Sheikh Abdul Nasser, Mashallah, memorized the Quran at age ten, and I think. He, I asked him one time how long it took him to memorize the Quran because, like, obviously, finishing memorizing the Quran is a goal for a lot of us, uh, even just memorizing regularly in general. So I said, Sheikh, that's awesome. Ten years old. Wow. When did you start? Like seven, eight? You know, because I think the the shortest I've ever heard was under a year. And he said, Oh, when did I start? I said, Yeah. He said, Ten. I said, But you said you finished when you were ten. He goes, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and so you know what. I don't know if I find it that difficult to resent. No, I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? So so you were you were on that path early. Yeah. And you were known. You were leading Tarawi at like 13. Yeah. Okay. So at Khaliville Masjid. Yeah. Shout out to Khaliville Masjid, mashallah. Um, so you were involved. Your dad got you involved really early. So these guys started to resent you a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we eventually connected and reconciled. And it took it actually took me being very, like, really, really going out of my way. Uh, to just kind of reach out to people, to talk to them, be like, hey, just want to catch up, say salam. Um, and some of them would kind of test, kind of like almost kind of like test me a little bit. So I remember one of the guys asked me to meet him at this, um, it was kind of like, um, yeah, it wasn't, Careful. it wasn't totally a bar. But it was like a very college kind of where there's big TV, so sports are on, there's pool tables. There was a bar in the corner, but he told me to kind of like meet him there. Oh, okay, okay. So just... And I kind of like walked in and I, I didn't hang out for a long time, but I just, just me just showing up just to kind of say hi, salam to him and just kind of being like, hey, listen, I'm kind of busy. I got to run. So, cause I didn't want to <laughs> hang out in a bar. <laughs> so, um, but just the fact that I was willing to go there to say what's up to him. Yeah was his way of kind of testing that you're not calling me just to tell me how terrible of a human being I am. It's no agenda. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it had a really, really detrimental effect, man. People left the masjid. We've counted in years um, there being about 50 people who converted to Islam who then – and again, we don't know to what extent. We hope not completely, but through their own public proclamations and yeah. now Facebook and things like that, fifty people who had embraced Islam who then left Islam. Dang, and a lot of hopefully, and just in one suburb. Hopefully, what the goal is. I mean, that's obviously like the, what the damage control goal is is that they just left the community. Yeah, that's it. And they still have belief, you know, of a lot of messenger. But the, so one of the things I think that's you know very very interesting is that there's this sort of sense of community and then w one or two people literally it could be like an imam it could be a board member can ruin it for everybody everybody you know there's like hundreds of people potentials that yeah. are there willing to help support because people we're, we're communal beings we yeah. want to be around each other we want to yeah. hang out but simply with a culture that can be offset by one or two people it could really ruin it, it and you be, know it can be the rogue preacher it can be the rogue volunteer oh yeah yeah, and I mean, I, I came across that term, one of our buddies and friends, Omar Usman, um, he shared with me, because he kind of like um, keeps an eye on a lot of this interesting type of stuff, uh, and he sent me one time an article from a Christian blog mm. about churches and some of the dynamics in churches, and he's like, L read this, this sounds like they're talking about the uncle from the masjid. Like just a general title, the uncle from the masjid. Everyone's got that uncle. Exactly. You know. And um, it was shout out to uncles, by the way. <laughs> it was it was called rogue volunteer. Oh wow! Right, and it was basically about the the guy, the board member, the volunteer, the committee brother, uh, and equally, I'm kind of throwing in there can be rogue pre preachers as well. Yeah, absolutely. That they just go rogue, and then you basically end up in this predicament. My big what. What I feel like was a huge personal victory for me was my dad is an older, you know, immigrant, mm. um, kind of very traditionally oriented, like the, the way he learned religion and kind of the people he learned it from. It was later in life um, when I was a kid, but still he learned it from a very traditional perspective. Um, and so he always had kind of this apprehension about we can't 
tell we can't kind of like tell somebody not to come to the masjid we can't kind of push somebody away from the masjid anybody how, how old was your dad when he when he really became engaged in, yeah it was in his well into his 30s like self motivated let's yeah, say yeah very self motivated so wow. it it was just kind of like even when a volunteer kind of goes rogue and you know we kind of say you got to move in you got to shut that guy down yeah you got to tell him hey listen you got to chill all right you got to take it easy uh, or else we might just have to ask you to just take your act elsewhere. Yeah. I'm not telling you. I'd rather you that. sacrifice one than 300. Exactly. And you exactly. you had a really funny story once you told me about your dad that he, he, he became a little bit frustrated with you guys like in his first year or so of practicing. Yeah. Like the rest of the family wasn't following suit or something. And there so. was a, there was a huge scholar in Pakistan, um, named, uh, Mufti Zainul Abidin, rahimahullah ta'ala. I had an opportunity to meet him, uh, while I was still pretty young. So my dad just was very, you know, everyone's kind of got like an like an alim or a sheikh that they feel very connected to. Yeah. That was a person my father felt extremely connected to. Mm-mm-mm. And um, so he went to go visit him. And he kind of told him, he's like, you know, Mufti Saab, here's the situation. I'm kind of a year or so ago, I got kind of got practicing and I'm trying to get my family into it. And they're not really keeping up with me. They're not keeping pace with me, you know, wanting to go to the masjid three times a day and wanting to do this, wanting to do that. And um, he kind of looked at my dad and he's like, okay, so you started practicing about a year or so ago. How old are you? And my dad was probably in his like, whatever, mid thirties or something. And he said that, um, so it took you 33 years to figure out, Mm -hmm. to figure it all out. And you want them to figure it out in like in eight months. 33 minutes. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And um, he's like, that's not how it works. And and, and just between us, I mean, you can obviously conclude, but just between us, how many, how many marriages have we seen fall apart because of this? A ton, a ton. So what did he tell your dad? What did he- so so he just said, he said, you just got to slow your roll. Yeah. And then another uh, senior alim that both my father and I, we both benefited from a lot, uh, Mulana Ahmed Lat, Sheikh Ahmed Lat in mm-hmm. India. He was a student of Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, rahimullah. He told my father, and, and I was there as well, he was just kind of talking to us and he said, because my dad was kind of telling him this story much, much later on. What And I, we're having this conversation with him once I had done, I had graduated from my studies and I was just extensively traveling with him and learning from him and being mentored by him. And he, my dad kind of told him the story, like I had this conversation like 30 years ago or 25 years ago with Mufti Zain al-Abideen and today we're sitting here having a totally different conversation with you. Um, and... Sheikh Ahmed Lat, he actually said at that time, he said that somebody who kind of, somebody who take undertakes the journey, a, a spiritual journey with their family and their loved ones goes further. Wow. Because he, he gave like that famous statement, you yeah. know, if you want to go, go, what is it? Go far, you go together. Something. If you want to go fast, you go alone. Exactly. Right. So it's like, it's going to, it's going to obviously slow you down. Sure. To have people. But you'll go of, further. I mean, think of further. taking a road trip. Yeah. Think of taking a road trip. I, I can drive maybe eight, maybe 10, maybe 12, maybe 16 hours. All right, calm down there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we need to take another road trip. I, haven't, I, I, need, I need a really good nap. We need to take another road trip. <laughs> but that's so. actually a compliment because you don't really sleep in cars with other people. I do not. Because you have trust issues. I do. What happened as a child? Abdullah. <laughs> Your brother, oh man, he's the worst driver. A little ever. artistic with his driving. Let's put it that way. He's an artist. <laughs> oh man, um, uh, I remember one of our buddies, Muiz. He had the worst story. Um, I flew in Chicago, and there was like this retreat, youth retreat, in somewhere in um, where's that? Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, kind of far out, not like Milwaukee, super close. Chicago it was kind of far out in Wisconsin, somewhere in the wilderness. With, with Milana, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, it was like a four-hour drive. He was really looking forward to it. He's like, we can catch up. We can talk. Uh-uh. <laughs> I sat down in that car and I knocked out. Yeah, shout out to Hadefa, <laughs> who always texts me when – he's texting me to see if you're actually alive. Because <laughs> he's like, this guy's in my front seat. He hasn't spoken for six hours. I Like, I may – he may be dead. I don't know what to do. Like, do I call the police at this point? I'm like, no, he's just sleeping. <laughs> I remember when we got to the youth camp because it was like four hours away and I, then I woke up. I'm like, oh, man. And then <laughs> – he wouldn't talk to me for like a day You're like, at, the youth camp, at the youth camp. He was like, every time I walked up, hey, what's going on? He's like, nope, get away from me. <laughs> so good. So, but um, yeah, if you're taking a road trip, you drive a f- however many hours you can drive and then you got to stop. But 
you know, you got like three, four drivers in the car, you take turns driving and you just, it's just the journey is further. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the idea. So, um, so you told your dad that basically. So, yeah. And that, that helped tremendously. But yeah, what I was talking about, like the personal victory was because of that whole traditional viewpoint that we can never say no to anybody Mm -hmm. in the masjid. Um, but meaning you can't say no to maybe the people who aren't, who are kind of still learning their thing, but you also can't say no to the overzealous rogue volunteer guy, the guy who basically appointed himself as the gatekeeper of the masjid. You can't even say no to him. And me and my father used to kind of go back and forth on this a lot. Cause I was like, no, you got to shut that dude down, shut that dude down ASAP. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, um, and I remember it was a few years ago when my dad kind of told me, he was like, you know that thing we used to always kind of just, just like have a conversation, have a discussion, kind of a debate, like a friendly debate about over dinner and stuff like yes or no, uh, about whether you can kind of shut somebody down. You can tell somebody no. And he's like, I 100% agree with you now. Oh, wow. Because he's like, it just, I just saw the wreckage, the debris, just the waste you know, kind of like a tornado, how it just lays waste and leaves like, uh, like just a complete, it, it just wreaks havoc and leaves all this like havoc in its wake. Mm-hmm. He said, I've seen some of these people on their tears in a community, in a masjid for five, 10, 15, 20 years. And I've just seen, I've seen the carnage. That's the word, the carnage that they've left behind. And he said, I realized that if I would have just gotten in his face, not, no, we're not talking about you necessarily have to ban somebody from the masjid, but just get in somebody's face and say, look, you got two options here. You can either just, just calm down. Mm-hmm. Just let, let people live or you're just going to have to take it elsewhere. So I'll play devil's advocate. Like now, what if somebody's coming to the masjid and, and this person from their perspective, they see it as like protecting the house of Allah. Or making it sacred. Like I know, like for example, when we do community events, we might, for example, have like the aunties and uncles and the men and the women sitting in the same hall. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, everyone's comfortable in the sense that there's uh, ad- adequate spacing for everybody. You know, um, no one's like sitting on each other's back or lap or anything like that. There's comfortable spacing, but I know that there's some people uncomfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I do when we do our teen events, we have like for example, like FIFA. Mm-hmm. You know, we're playing Madden. And, uh, I remember one uncle actually walked in and, uh, cause the kids were playing Madden from Maghrib to Isha. So, um, he didn't come from Maghrib, but he came for Isha. And as he came in for Isha, he kind of made like this, like, you know, when they try to act like they're talking to themselves, but they're actually talking to everybody in the room, right? It's like passive aggressiveness to the T, right? Mashallah, shout out to Pakistan, India, passive aggressive. <laughs> so, uh, so he said out loud, he's like, oh, this is not what the mush, oh, is this what the mush is for now? It's for games. You know, for the youth. And I was like, I actually turned to him and I said, actually, they prayed Melgar bin Jamal and I didn't see you here. Mm. Almost like to show him that, like, there is some sort. I, I understand your concern for the sanctity of this space. I am, too. Mm-hmm. We're not playing Gears of War. We're not we're not watching, you know, yeah. uh, Netflix channels we're that might be problematic. Yeah, exactly. We're How do you know about uh, anyways? Uh, <laughs> we're playing Madden. Right. And even yeah. then, like, obviously, when there's like cheerleader, we turn the music all the way down in yeah. the settings. We did all the proper precautions. So how do you now like how do you balance that? So there's the sanctity of the masjid, which this person's clearly excited to defend. Mm. And then there's obviously the whole purpose of trying to bring people to the masjid in the first place. How so, far can you go? So this go this goes back to a more fundamental question. What's the basis of being the guardian of the sanctity of the masjid? Where's the reference for that? Where's the precedence for that? <laughs> so, I mean, you, you see at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, you know, the, the common examples uh, between, you know, uh, the, 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 the Bedouin coming and urinating in the masjid. Mm. Yes, the Prophet Wasallam instructed him that's not the right thing to do. But at the same time, they didn't take, you know, some drastic action. Mm. Um, the prophets, you know, people would lie down and stretch out in the masjid, take naps there, eat food there. Uh, the prophet some had, you know, um, you know, the prophet Salati Salam had, you know, uh, he would do when he would do a take off there. There's a narration talking about his wife brushing and combing his hair in the masjid. Things that things that weren't explicit worship. Exactly. Basically. Yeah, I mean all types of things. When Muadh bin Sa- Saad bin Muadh was injured and he was bleeding, and they were kind of nursing him, the Prophet said, "Put his tent in the masjid." Mm. So you had a man 
it, the masjid was like an infirmary. So you kind of had a multitude, open question and answers, open discussions, conversations. Um, all of that was going on in the masjid. So, okay. And, and the, what I was going to actually ask was, is the masjid now different than it was then? I feel like a little bit did it in the sense that living as a minority a yeah. community in this country, it's become more of a communal space. It has. Whereas masjid is, you know, obviously it's in a can. And even then, so I, can, I can even reconcile all of that. Why? Because inside of an Islamic center, you should have a masjid area. The musalla area. Like the actual musalla. That's it. The place where salah is done. That's it. Gotcha. And then... So, and think about how ridiculous it is once you kind of frame the conversation that way. We're reprimanding somebody for talking in a lobby. Yeah, that's very true. It's not a masjid. When they're like, don't talk loudly in the masjid. It's not a masjid. It's, it's a lobby, dude. You, you're you really good at that. It's, it <laughs> I heard like you, it my whole like, life. No, no, no. Up. I don't think you heard it. It sounds like you. you I do you, it. You do. <laughs> I drive. I drive around to like masjids where people don't know me and just go yell at the young whippersnappers. Just yeah. go yell at kids. Hey, y'all. Just ruining kids' lives with a masjid <laughs> yeah. at the time. Behave yourselves. But yeah. uh, you know, it's it's so ridiculous. You're, you're reprimanding people for having a conversation in a classroom. Yeah. yeah. It's not a masjid. Stop calling every single spot in your 40,000 square foot gaudy facility. Okay. Stop calling every single spot the masjid. It's not. It's an, it's a center. It's a community center. There is a masjid musalla sacred portion. Yeah. And, and I think like that helps everybody feel happy. Oh yeah. You know, that helps everybody feel Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy now. So the, the little, the, the, the nice little, you know, uh, green carpeted with the stripes on the carpet, that little area, that's where you can go and sit down and read your Quran. That's where the elder uncle can kind of sit who just wants some peace and quiet and some meditation and dhikr and dua. He can go sit down there. Then that hall in the back, uh, or the lobby area or the classrooms on the side or the gym that's attached. You know, that's where people can be walking around and eating and drinking and laughing and joking and playing and running. They can do whatever they want and mm -hmm. everybody's happy. Everybody mind your own business. Yeah. And even if some kid strays and wanders into the masala area. Then remember the narration about a Bedouin urinating in the masjid. Yeah. And the Prophet Sallallahu not allowing the Sahaba to basically execute him on the so spot. So you heard it here. All kids, go ahead. And, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's Qiyas Malfatik, actually. Yeah. That is bad Qiyas. Okay. Uh, so now going back to Arlington. So that was sort of the state. People didn't quite understand uh, the goal and function of the space. And, and as a result, people left. Yeah. And actually till today, I mean, 2016, young people are coming to my and our programs at Colleyville, which mm -hmm. for those of you who aren't in Dallas, it's north of Arlington. It's yeah, actually it's probably just north of Arlington. Minutes. And people from Arlington, you mm -hmm. know, that when I asked them on Sunday at the teen Holika or Friday, like you and I did the family night the other night, um, I'll add, hey, where are you from? I haven't seen you around here very much. Or what's your name? You know, what what community do you live in? And they'll say Arlington, Arlington yeah. Texas. Yeah. Because I think they kind of feel, um, you know, like they don't feel safe. They don't feel home mm -hmm. anymore. And and I think this is a lesson to all masjids everywhere is that you're not invincible. No. You know, the house of Allah as an entity, as a philosophy is invincible. Mm -hmm. But you running it and even it being run in this specific building or space is not invincible. It can yeah. change. If someone's arrogant, Allah can downgrade that facility real quick. Yeah. Right? Allah, Allah Ta'ala can do that. And so a uh, big lesson to people that your community is not always going to stick with you through and through. I mean, if you abuse them, they will leave. Yes. And so you had this culture. Now October 30th rolls around mm. back in your childhood days. Yeah. In Arlington, Texas. Yeah. Where people are leaving the Masjid Afwaja. Okay? Mm -hmm. Afwaja obviously means like in droves. Yeah. Right? It's a little bit of a little bit of a sort of Arabic joke. Um, what... Is Halloween like? Is there Halloween yet? No. Haramoween? No. That's just Haramoween. No. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, it's interesting with a lot of things I didn't get to kind of experience the other side of things. Halloween, interestingly enough, was something that as a very, very young child, uh, I remember participating in because my parents weren't really. So this was know. like back in 1940. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Roosevelt was president. <laughs> like me and Donald Trump went to the same elementary school. Yeah. <laughs> so it, I actually remember. But this was in the 70s. Yeah. The 80s. Early 80s. 80s. Okay. Early 80s. So when I was born. Yeah. Just remember that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I remember participating in uh, Halloween and stuff. 
Um, but then once my parents got kind of practicing and religious, then there was kind of a, the brakes were pumped on that. The brakes were put on that, which was fine. I adjusted pretty easily. Um, and a lot of parents, just to pause here, a lot of parents, like they pump the brakes, you know, good quote there. They pump the brakes on it, not because they themselves understand Islamic law, no. but because they're being told. Exactly. Right. So like they hear the khatib at the masjid. Don't let your kids celebrate Halloween. Otherwise, they'll become kafir. Right. And they're like, oh, God. Like, we've yeah, been, exactly. We've been te- we thought that could Quran for too long to let them become kafir exactly. for some candy. Yeah. And so they, they sort of – it is kind of the hyperbole, you know, the hyperbolic sort of extreme. Right. And a lot and of parents just sort of like, you, I don't want any part in this. Exactly. Like they'll they'll keep their kids home from school that day. They won't um, answer their door when people are coming and knocking the door, ringing the doorbell. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we put out an empty bowl and say, please take one. <laughs> 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 and more so because – more so because and, – and now that I think about it actually, it is probably horrible Dawa, although now I live in like an almost a neighborhood here in Dallas. Uh, unfortunately, I live in an almost a neighborhood. But um, – <laughs> It, it is. It is. It is. You know. It is probably one of the few chances that Muslim neighbors have to, you know, maybe buy some like halal rice krispie treats. Mm. And just that word again. I'm not trying to like you know yeah. step on where I shouldn't be walking, but mm. I, I now sort of in a way regret doing that. Mm. Right. So your parents would turn the lights off, lock the door, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And um, so that's kind of what it was. And there was almost like this not even doing anything alternative on that night. So what it really, really was like. So. Again, from the masjid, it was kind of like this heavy preaching a month in advance about like, look out, don't do anything. Yeah. Don't let your kids do anything. Look out. And, uh, <laughs> Keep your head on the yeah, the, you know, the, the, the end is near and, um, Just go look at your kids closets for costumes. They might be hiding. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> but what it really, really was like on the back end was those families that just were not were kind of like checked out who had kind of strayed from the masjid who weren't really down with it who maybe just hadn't gotten very involved or practicing yet um they were still basically doing it mm. um and but here's the problem though in doing it they were here's the real issue there's no issue with somebody kind of doing whatever it is that they want to do. We can't police everybody. But in doing it, they were basically made to feel like there's no point to you doing anything Islamic or religious anymore. Wait, so you're saying that – hold on. You guys hear that siren? That's sarcasm <laughs> alert coming. So you're saying that there's there's no all or nothing in Islam? Yeah. But brother, didn't Allah say enter the deen kafa? Right. Didn't he say enter it completely? Absolutely. Submit wholly? Submit wholly. So – no, see now you're you're doing this liberal twisting now. See? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm actually explaining the words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this is oh, so knowledge is inconvenient sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so people were made to feel, and you've heard this by the way with hijab. Yeah, of course. You've heard this with all kinds of things. You all, know, uh, everything. You're doing X. Don't bother doing anything else. Yeah. Even though X is just one percentage or one portion of Islam as a whole, not Precisely. diminishing it. You know, selling liquor. Uh, you know, wearing hijab is a big deal, right? Staying away from selling haram is a big deal. You know, Huge. people should be, you know, pat on the back. Allah, Allah is going to reward them, inshallah. Big sacrifice, you know, Huge. big sacrifice. But at the same time, if somebody doesn't have the conviction or strength or belief yet um, that they can do it, then that doesn't mean you, they're not Muslim. Yeah, why are you discouraging somebody from praying five times a day? Why are you discouraging somebody from fasting in Ramadan? And this reminds me of the hadith that we that we just covered in tafsir of Surah Hajarat. Mm-hmm. Where uh, you know the 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 man who was a who was doing some loot act, you know he was a thief, mm-hmm. and um, this is actually in Ibn Kathir, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, and I think Mufti Shafi also mentioned it. Rahim Allah, the the he was caught, and the Prophet Sallallahu didn't answer by punishing, but he answered by asking a question. So when the man was mm-hmm. brought to the Prophet, he said, "Does he pray?" Yeah, and you know they said, "Yeah," and it was almost like the way they answered was sort of like almost like they were confused. Mm. Uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu asked that question and they said, you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, L- let him be because either one of them will leave, you know, right. either the thievery, the lewd act or whatever he's doing, either one will leave, you know, right. um, and so let him continue praying, let her continue praying mm. and just motivate towards good. Yeah. There's no reason. Yeah. Let the, I mean, when it's dark in a room, al haq wa zahaq al batil. When, when it's dark in a room, do you just sit there and keep on talking about how it's dark in the room or do you try to turn on the light? Mm. And when you turn on the light, the darkness is gone. Absolutely. So bring some light to people's lives. Absolutely. Like, I mean, everyone gets so bent out of shape 
but it's maybe try to use the opportunity to have like an alternative type event, bring the kids together, um, you know, show them a good time, have some good food for them. And in between there, they're going to end up praying Salah, mm-hmm. maybe have a couple of insightful conversation. You don't even have to preach to them, like, like, like talk down to them, preach to them, right? Just have a couple of like intriguing, insightful conversations and get them kind of thinking, get them kind of feeling mm. a little bit, get that stir, that Iman in the heart just a little bit and let it do it. Let it, it do its job. Mm. Trust. Yeah, trust the process. Trust the the process, process works. It's worked for 1,400 years. Um, but we we got to get over this paranoia. And, you know, again, I don't mean to say that we shouldn't have any type of respect for rules and regulations and fiqh and usul in our deen. Of course we do. And we should. And we that's why... And you teach it nine hours a day. Yeah, I mean, that's why we have to respect the tradition and respect the scholars and have that system in our, in our ummah. But at the same time, just... A little bit of a, a little bit of a thought, just something to kind of share, and that is, Islam's been here for fourteen hundred years, and will be here for a while longer. You're not the savior. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Don't like, worry. It, almost like I think one thing, one way to sort of phrase it in a nice little tweetable quote. Oh no, hint, hint. <laughs> that Islam's here for you. You're not here for Islam. Exactly. And and that's and, and when you think of yourself in that way, your leverage all of a sudden is gone. You need it. It yeah. doesn't need you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's put you on the spot now. Okay. Mariam and Aisha, Muhammad, they come to you. Nice. And they're all dressed up. It's October 30th, 31st, and they're ready to go trick-or-treating. <sighs> are you going to – are you going to mock or imitate the disbelievers, brother? <laughs> I'm just using Arlington quotes because I want to just yeah you know, exactly PTSD. no I mean why not these are these these are exactly um, the conversations that people have had with their kids um, what I so what do you so what do you what's your thought process like walk me through that as a father uh, as an imam as a scholar as somebody who teaches what do you do when somebody comes to you or your kids come to you so let me so let me kind of split this up into two things number one as <clears throat> As a student, somebody who studied a little bit, um, I have this – knowledge is a burden, all right? They talk about the burden of knowledge, um, and it it is a burden, right? Yes, it's a gift and it's a privilege and all that, but it's most definitely a burden. And somebody who doesn't acknowledge that probably either doesn't have it or should not have it. And by burden, just want to do a little bit of English tafsir here. Yeah. Burden not meaning one that something someone hates. Oh, yeah. So not something that sucks yeah, or something yeah. it's like just, that. It's, it's, it's something that someone's carrying. Oh, yeah. It's a responsibility. It's very heavy. You know, it's, it's, a, a, it's, very, very heavy. It's, it's, it's a responsibility. Yeah. And it most definitely is. Yeah. Um, I mean, think about the burden of knowledge that like maybe a physician has when their kid coughs or gets a fever or something. They know of the 87 different possibilities that this could result in. Mm-hmm. That's got to be terrifying. Absolutely. Yeah. That's got to be terrifying. Yeah. Right. So whereas my kid coughs and I'm like, hey, drink some water. Stop making noise. <laughs> <laughs> I, once knew, I once knew a microbiologist. And I asked her, I was like, how do you live? Mm-hmm. How do you mm-hmm. eat? You mm-hmm. know what's on that door handle. Yeah. You know what's on that plastic fork. Uh, our buddy, uh, Tokir from Column Travel, he... Shout out Column Travel. Yeah, he he's same thing, microbiology and all this basic stuff. Um, and he's like this crazy intense germaphobe. Yeah, yeah. I've actually... I, I did Hudge with him I'm though, this year. It was, it was comical. I mean, it kept me going. <laughs> like just seeing... Because Hudge is like... Hudge is a lot of tests. It's a test of your will, a test of your strength, a test of your iman. It's also it's a, a te- gathering of the believers and diseases. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the germs are like, hey, let's make a lump. Uh, no, but it was also a test, honestly, of his, you know, his ability to sort of deal with the fact that there might be some like different germs, bacteria he wasn't used to. So that was that was a riot, alhamdulillah. And so, um, so as you're saying, it's a burden having this knowledge, humongous burden, right? So, so. On one side, I kind of know, and I'll tell you what, what I mean by burden is, I can't just pull a dad move and just kind of just make a judgment call purely based off of, you know, what I want to do or what I think should happen here. Mm. Um, because I'm, I'm also burdened by the realization of 
this conversation, what is the outcome of this conversation from a legal perspective? Is this thing that my children are asking me to do, is it haram? Mm -hmm. Or is it not preferable? Makru? Is it impermissible? Or is it discouraged? Or is it permissible? Or is it encouraged? Or is it mandatory? Like I, I, I know that scale. So I'm aware of the fact, and that's a whole nother kind of rabbit hole, I guess, but I don't b see it to be impermissible, haram. I see it to be discouraged at best. Explain your logic on this, because I think a lot you're gonna a lot of people's minds are being blown right now. So you just used you know legal Islamic legal terminology, yes, impermissible haram, something that we're all very used to uh, that word, and you're saying that Halloween, the thing that we've been told our entire lives, yeah, that it is absolutely haram. And there are other scholars, by the way, who do who do you know sort of come to the conclusion that they believe it's impermissible for their different reasons. Yeah, you're saying that according to your studies and your understanding. You don't think it's haram? I don't. Why and, is that? And I'll explain exactly why. I don't think that it's completely haram and impermissible for the following reason. Um, so first of all, little disclaimer, a uh, little note. There's a difference between legal terminology and just kind of general verbiage and language. Mm. So when I say impermissible, I mean from a technical perspective. I don't want anyone to confuse impermissible with inappropriate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That when I say I don't think that it's impermissible, it's haram. I'm not saying that I don't think it's inappropriate. An example of that is like, for example, uh, divorce is halal. Right. But it's not necessarily it's, a very happy thing. And exactly. Fact, you know, the hadith tells us it's the thing that Allah dislikes. Right. Uh, and most. so that's, that's the kind of thing. So something can be permissible yet still be inappropriate. Um, so that's not what I'm, so that's the first disclaimer. Secondly, for, in order for something to be impermissible haram, particularly from this kind of like the usul that I, the school of thought, I guess you can kind of say, the usul that I particularly am inclined towards, that's not to say it's the only right one, they have very, um, they have, they, they have very serious requirements in order for something to be declared impermissible. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. You're a Hanafi. Yeah. Hanafi trained. Yeah. Hanafi trained Muslim lawyer. <laughs> Uh, that's what I tell people muftis are. I'm like, they're Muslim lawyers. He's like, oh, okay. Do they make as much? I'm like, not quite. Uh, <laughs> not even close. So you're, you're Hanafi. A lot of people associate Hanafi madhab with strictness, conservativeness. So the H doesn't stand for Hanafi. The H stands for haram. Haram. Yeah. yeah. Whereas now you're saying it's actually the Hanafi madhab. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Man, very God nice. forgive me for that one. <laughs> both, so, the, both for the joke and also the desecration of the madhab. <laughs> yeah. So the... Absolutely. It takes a lot in order to be able to declare something haram. It's got to be qat'iyu thubut and qat'iyu dalala. Which, which means definitive in its, you know, in, in, its, its, in its transmission and also in its meaning. Perfect. Yeah. It's got to be definitive, absolute in its confirmation, uh, in its transmission, its confirmation, and in how clearly it speaks to the issue. There can't be any figurative speech. Zero. You know, and there's a lot of things. We talked about this at Faith Intensive this mm -hmm. year. There's a lot of things that people take that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Arabic, and he used beautiful eloquence, his figurative language. Mm -hmm. And people would say, oh, this is clear that it's haram, when in fact he might be talking about just making something, you know, makru. Or he might just be talking about something yeah. that he himself, you know, there's the famous example of the, the date palm tree planters. Yeah. When he made a comment about the way that they fertilized right. and they, they interpreted it as a ruling. Mm -hmm. So they didn't do it and they didn't get their crops, you know, for that season. And when they asked him, he said, you know, you're the farmers, I'm the prophet. Like, mm -hmm. don't misinterpret, right? Yeah. So that's not to say that the prophet can't comment I no. said I'm on mundane issues. But he's just saying, like, I don't. Really care. But rulings are serious. Yeah. Basically. Very, That's what I'm serious. here to address is what's what's right and wrong. Yeah. What you should and should not do. So it takes a lot to establish something as haram. And what the ruling of that was based off of was the fact that there were pagan and, um, you know, hedonistic no, and like satanic, sa satanic and, yeah. and sadistic, um, you know, origins to this particular holiday and celebration. Which again, history is history. That's one of the things that you don't deny that you don't get to deny. So, um, absolutely, that would make it impermissible. Uh, or, or excuse me, I'm sorry. If something does have 
wrong origins, then that has to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. That has to be understood. Yeah. And we're not denying that here. However, does that in and of itself, does a historical account of, you know, what something is and where it originated from, is that enough to definitively call it haram? That's question number one. I don't think it is. Interesting. Okay. Number two. Number two is that at at the same time, we do have to kind of deal in reality that what if something is no longer represented? Um, something no longer represents what it used to represent at a particular time. And this this is a question on you know what would then be called the you know adilla or the adilla sharia, right? Right, so adilla sort of, sharia. So the, the sort of the proofs or the evidences that we use in in Islamic law, right? And I think what you're addressing now is custom. Exactly. You know, so what's customary? And that's like way down the list, like way down eight the list. or nine. But it still is something that takes into play. You know, an adam hakam that right. you know the idea that culture can 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 impact a ruling, right? Based on how people interpret. And I'm it. I'm even just talking about the if determining the reality of something before you pass a ruling on it. So I'll take it kind of. Uh, how do you do that? So so here's the thing. Is it your opinion? Like, is it me? Like, do I sit here and say, you know what? Halloween to me still is, is pagan, like satanic. Yeah. People right. like going and doing satanic rituals. So therefore it's haram. Like, how do I, as an imam, how do I process this? So, and that's precisely why this is actually making my point, not taking away from my point. Do you see how much subjectivity there is in this discussion? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Anything that has this much subjectivity, anything that can have this much discussion and this much difference of opinion, it's telling you one thing right away. It's not conclusive. So what makes what makes legitimate difference of opinion? In this case, for example, Halloween, like when would we know? What's an example where Halloween would be haram? Like is it if the kid comes up to you and has like a dead animal in their hand and they're like, I'm going to the woods for three hours? Like, and I'm going to go sacrifice this animal to Satan yeah, I'd tell them if if that's their interpretation of Halloween and that's their celebration of Halloween, then I tell them Halloween is haram for them. Okay. Or if a kid, for example, you know, Halloween is very is now very sexual above a certain age, mm. you know. Uh, and so if a kid, maybe, maybe he's going to a party um, in high school, let's say, or like in college, and that young person, that young man or woman is going to be in an environment where people are wearing costumes that don't have the purpose of trick-or-treating. Let's just no. put it that way. Or a different kind. Uh, stuck for a lot, double, double. But now you have a person who is going for the sexual reason that yeah. could that could lend itself to the impermissibility. I think so. But I if a kid so. comes up to you, Miriam, Aisha, and Muhammad, and they say, "Dad, all of our friends are getting candy tonight. They're walking around the city getting candy. Can we go?" So that's what I was talking about. I have that burden of knowledge, where, or at least my personal opinion, um, where I don't think it's impermissible. And knowing that and saying that and admitting that, I would still try my best to not let my kids go. Why? I would do it more so not because of the immediate detriment that it uh, could have right now or that it poses, but... I would do it not to set the precedent, not to kind of open the door to the slippery slope, because I am aware of what Halloween becomes oh, I see. as soon as people become teenagers. Would you? Could someone then use tadadaraya for this? Which is in Arabic, it's the cutting off of the, uh, just like the, oh, it would be turns as like nipping in the bud, basically. Like exactly. Not allowing something to even get close. To some degree, but again, see, that language becomes relevant when... I'm making a legal ruling. This mm. is more tarbiyatan. So this goes back to our earlier conversation. This is a personal judgment and a personal call I'm making. I'm not imposing it on the community. So you're you're pretty you're pretty firm in your in your legal opinion that it's not haram. Yeah. But it's more of your own personal caution. Yeah. But you're not going to project that. No. Like I, I we were talking about it even before we got started the podcast. Um I, there's like been a rule. I have a television in my home, even growing up, my dad, who again, my parents kind of had, eventually became somewhat more traditional and I guess you can kind of say conservative. Um, we always had a television in the home, but the one kind of rule was we didn't have cable or satellite. Hmm. And I can't, and I'm mentioning again, I have a television in the home, the Apple TV's hooked up to it, the Wii's hooked up to it, where we can play games and stuff. Um, but we don't have cable or satellite. 
and I'm not by any stretch, by any definition saying cable or, cable or satellite, I'm not giving a ruling that it's haram or it's not allowed or it's impermissible. What I'm essentially saying is it's a personal choice. I don't think it's good for me and I don't think it's good for my kids and so I don't do it. It's my bread. Nice. So what? So if parents come to you and they say, you know, my kids, they're really, really fixed on this and it's really – it's caught, it's an issue in the home – and we feel really, really bad that we have to like bully them into not doing this. Um, you think it would be? I might, I might tell them to make a concession. Listen, just kind of tell them. Listen, it's also a crazy world out there. There's a lot of creepos and a lot of weirdos out there. Mm. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go to these three, four like immediate neighbors, mm-hmm. and we're just gonna kind of call it a during day. The, like the, the the daylight hours. Yeah, like five o'clock when you get back from school, we we'll hit up a couple of our immediate neighbors, people we can trust, and then yeah. we'll call it. A Come day. back from El Group. Yeah. Okay. And maybe you can explain to them then, even like as a parent, like that this is something that we do now. It's cool. And I would also look at, you know, before I kind of even gave that, I would look at the parents and who they are. A lot of times you got that situation where the parents, number one, maybe haven't done a fantastic job kind of raising the kids up to this particular point. And then they've had that religious awakening moment. Mm. They started watching YouTube videos and following religious Facebook pages. And they got like really intense all of a sudden. I mean, again, it's that whole thing that I told the story about my dad. Now they're asking the kids go f- to go from zero to 60 in three seconds. Yeah. Or number two, this is a big one. This one's a doozy. How much time and work and energy and effort are they willing to put in? How much are, do those parents inconvenience? And I'm not passing any judgment, but how much inconvenience do they put themselves through in order to make sure that their kids – have a good life and have a lot of fun and get to do a lot of cool things. Like good life, like socially fulfilling. Yeah. Not just like, you know, because a lot of parents, a lot of parents, and rightfully so, it's tough earning a living. Very tough. A lot of parents say, well, I provide, I do this. But you're talking about now like taking them to swim practice. Yeah. Signing them up for soccer teams. Right. uh, Taking them on vacation. You know, it doesn't even have to be Disney World and any of that stuff. That stuff can get expensive, but it's more about are you willing to hop into a car and drive to a local city? You know, spend the night in a hotel and try their restaurants and go see their their landmarks, you know, like Austin for us. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll make it even simpler, okay? I understand all that, and, I, and I'm, I'm right there with you. I need a parent to basically explain to me how many days, and I'm being sarcastic here, does it take, and how many hundreds of dollars does it take, and again, I'm being sarcastic here, to get a ball and to walk over to the nearest park to your house? Mm. And toss a ball around with your kid for twenty minutes every day. That's not too difficult. It's funny actually you mentioned that because some of my most fond memories of my dad. You're gonna laugh because I'm white, but uh, <laughs> was on the golf course. <laughs> and my dad, uh, ironically, I mean, my dad would take me to like basketball practice and all these things, but we would go play golf. And it's kind of a funny thing, but golf courses when it gets close to Mugrib time, basically between us and Mugrib, they'll charge half. Yeah. So you can play as many holes as you can get in before the night falls. Yeah. So my dad and I would make like a, a tradition out of it. We'd go like during the week and then during the weekend, my brother and I and my dad would go together, all three of us, and we'd get all that done. And those are some of the most – I mean those memories are so strong. I can like still remember the smell of the grass. I can mm-hmm. remember the temperature of the air. Like I remember everything. Why? Because it was such an important memory. Mm-hmm. And so you think that you have to spend a bunch of money, but really it's about spending time, right? Yeah, and it, and it goes even further than that, right? So <clears throat> I won't take too much credit because I still got a lot of stuff to figure out. That's what you say before you take a lot of credit. <laughs> but I remember my my parents, um, they, you know, folks who work really hard, they work five, six days a week, that one day a week they got off, they want to just be in the house, they just want to be, they just want to relax, they want to decompress, all that kind of stuff. But they would drive us all the way across town if needed to, you know, a friend's house or to a little get together with a couple of families where a couple of my buddies would be or whatever some event was going on or I was participating in some type of baseball league or, you know, a basketball tournament or something like that. And they would drive all the way out and take us there um, just so that, again, we felt like this sense of fulfillment. Mm. We get to do cool stuff. Like yesterday, my, 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 my daughters, they had tennis practice, mm. you know, and I took them for tennis class and they had tennis practice and they really had a blast. They had a great time. So now when I'm having, if I have a conversation with them where I kind of say like, listen, guys, um, I know you guys want to do this, but 
I don't think it's good. This is why Abu doesn't like it. And uh, I want you guys to really think about it. And I want you to understand. But don't worry. We're going to do something fun. Um, I think I'll have a little bit more credibility and capital with my kids. Mm. That's what it boils down to. And, and but, if I, but if I see a situation where that's just not happening, you know, the parents might just have to kind of bite the bullet in the short term and just kind of like make a compromise. Yeah. And and there's I I think what you're saying in summary is that there's 364 days. Yes. Other than Halloween. Yes. To make an impact. To make an impact. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think a lot of times we grew up in a generation. I'm sorry, you grew up in a generation, (laughs) and I also grew up in another generation. Careful. Where uh, being different was a little bit, I think, easier. Yeah. And you know, I work with a lot of teens now still, and I work with college kids and I'm working with adults as well. So I kind of like, I'm, I'm f- right now I'm working with the whole spectrum of the community. Um, whereas before I was a little bit more just with teens and I'm noticing that there's just this really intense pressure. Yeah. Um, the internet to not, sucks. To not be different, but also be different. Yeah. But at the same time, don't be too different because too different is kind of weird, but be a little bit weird. Whereas with us. There's just this overexposure and just over just saturation of just commentary from everyone on yeah. everything. And it's just, yeah, it gets. But, this is, but this is difficult for young people. I mean, I can imagine it's very difficult. And I so, have absolute disdain for it, but yeah. I can imagine that it's <laughs> extremely, extremely you're, difficult. You're angrily sympathetic. <laughs> I'm angrily so Get off my lawn. Yeah, please. But I understand that you don't have a lawn. <laughs> 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 yeah. So. Kids are going through this right now, and, right. and it right, it seriously might bother them, right? Mm. At the same time, like praying Fedra might bother them. Yeah. So we we obviously don't exclude excuse everything, Mm-mm. but at the same time, like I think what 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 I would say as a youth director and as somebody who has been a youth director in the past, and you know, sort of like has seen a lot, you know, over the past six years, I've seen a lot, mm. is that there are battles that you choose, mm-hmm. and there are battles that you will purposefully concede Mm -hmm. and there are battles that you will remain firm on Yeah, because raising children is a marathon. Yeah. Right. And, and the goal for our children is that they pass away as Muslims. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we, if we frame, exactly. If we frame, you know, for, for our listeners, that was a verse in the Quran where Allah said, don't pass away or don't, don't die. Don't let death come to you except that you are Muslim. So that's kind of like our thesis, right? That's our mission statement for children is Mm -hmm. I want to prepare you so that when your time comes to leave this world, you believe in Allah and his messenger. If you frame all of your interactions with your children and your decisions and your battles, quote unquote, with your children where you're trying to, you know, see if it's okay or if it's not okay with that, then you'll learn where to strategically concede, Mm -hmm. where to have your hudaybiyas and where to be very firm, Mm -hmm. right? Where to have your moments where you don't concede Mm -hmm. and and for the sake of discipline or moral development, etc. Halloween for some people may be a point of discipline and it may be. A point of concession right you know for some families who do a lot mm-hmm. you know they just got back from a vacation they just did this just did this and your kids like can i go trick or treat my friends you might say well you know what we just did a whole bunch of stuff like let's spend the night you know together as a family we want you to be home for dinner etc cetera, etc cetera. but there might be some kids where it truly does bother them you know yeah. you might have some kids who don't care yeah you shouldn't force them to go trick-or-treating no right just to fit in yeah but you may have some kids that it might really bother them and they might be really struggling with being muslim at school yeah and this might be the one thing you know you never know which straw breaks the camel's back yeah this might be the one thing that might stick with them that you know i don't even want to be muslim anymore and there's one whole factor that kind of works into this that's really interesting don't discount the element of um, – kind of goes back to where we started with all this, kind of the communal, social yes. pressure and image of it where the parent even kind of understands, look, I just have not earned enough credibility and capital with my kid. I haven't done things right to the point where I can really kind of put my foot down about this situation. Yeah. I technically, if I want to keep my child, if I don't want to lose my child, if I don't want my child to in this moment to make up their mind that the moment I can deuces, I'm out of here. Yeah. Right. College I, basically. Yeah. I will have to concede over here, but then what's everybody going to say? Yeah. 
the oh, oh, the, I'm going to go to the masjid and they're going to be like, oh, his kids go trick or treating. Well, don't go to the masjid in your SpongeBob outfit. <laughs> I mean, take that off first. <laughs> yeah, but he's worried about the fact that his kid's going to tell the other kids, oh, you didn't get to go trick or treating. Guess what? I got to go trick or treating. <laughs> You're doing just Rain's kid voice. <laughs> yeah. but Billy, gonna... Billy's mom went trick or treating with him <laughs> and you're not going trick or treating with me. <laughs> exactly. And. And then he's going to go, and then that kid's going to tell their parents, yeah. oh, yeah, well, uh, Khalid uncle's kid, Khalid uncle lets, you know, his son go trick-or-treating. Why don't you let me? And next time he goes to the masjid, then brother Ahmed is going to get in Khalid's kind of face or, or just talk about him to the other people like, oh, that brother, you know, his kids go trick-or-treating, astaghfirullah, and this and that. And it's like, you know what? Just just raise your kids, man, because that uh, those other people in the community who enjoy talking about you, Aren't ever going to help you raise your kids. And just admit that Hollow Uncle's cooler than you. Yeah. Once you admit that, Hollow yeah. Uncle's the coolest uncle. <laughs> yeah. So, but this has been, I mean, honestly, conversations like this for me personally, mm-hmm. you know, as somebody who is a student still, someone who's still studying, still really trying to get a lot more, but also at the same time, I'm doing what I can to patch together the community. I mean, the standard of imams is very low. And Extremely. that's why people like me are working as an imam. I mean, quite <laughs> honestly, right? And, um, I'm Almost. still, I, I, I keep, I keep my head down. I try to study, try to stay focused, but these conversations just open up this world to me of Islamic knowledge and Islamic law Yeah, that I think has been unfortunately misrepresented. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what at the heart of Qadam is that there has been a flagrant misrepresentation of Islam mm-hmm. and truly the solution is not found outside of Islam, but it's mm-hmm. found within it. And I think today in this conversation, we have a very relevant issue, Halloween, um, you know, and other things like that. Maybe another time we'll talk about Christmas mm. or Easter, or these other ones. And, you know, we talked about Halloween and how the community sort of like dealt with that for two yeah. decades, three decades. Yeah. And now we're sort of exploring a little bit more of the usul, the principles of Islam. And we're saying, well, this might not be what we thought it was. You know, this might not be what we thought it was. Or perhaps for some people, it shouldn't be allowed. Right. Yeah. And I think that's when you find that balance and that sort of duality in your Islamic practice. Because you're sincerely trying to do the right thing, yeah. It's when Islam becomes beautiful, yeah. You know, I, you always said this to me as a student, and I always say this now to people when I'm teaching: is that you know, Islam works if you give it a chance. Mm-hmm. It all works. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you only have one foot in, one foot out, it's not going to work. Yeah. But when you sort of go all in and you say, you know, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to yeah. submit, and I'm going to try my best, and I'm going to stumble along the way, but I'm going to try. It works. Yeah. And, and and along with that is sort of understanding Islamic principles and trying to apply them properly. So yeah. this has been awesome. This has been great. It's great. And Fantastic. I, I hope that everyone enjoyed hanging out with us Yeah. here on the Qalam Hangout. Inshallah, sure. we look forward to seeing you guys. Yeah, spread the word. Let other folks know, inshallah, so that they can also uh, start kind of tuning in. And if you all got any type of suggestions, uh, discussions, uh, that you think that we should have. Um, if you go to, uh, you're probably, a lot of folks are probably getting this on iTunes. So if you go to iTunes in the comments where you can kind of rate the podcast, you can kind of leave some topic suggestions there. Yeah. That's the easiest place where, where we can find it very easily or all t- in one place. Or tweet column hangout. Tweet column hangout hashtag. with the hashtag yeah. column hangout. Um, you know, leave, uh, go to the Facebook page. Um, inshallah, especially once we put up this particular episode in the comments of the post about the episode, you can leave some, uh, suggestions or comments there as well. And, uh, we just look forward to hearing from y'all, inshallah. See you guys, inshallah, next week, every Thursday morning, column hangout. Come hang out with us. Assalamualaikum. Thanks, sir.